Ken Klippenstein was a journalist from The Intercept who resigned recently. And he started a Substack, right? That old chestnut. And also published a post, a Substack called Why I'm Resigning from The Intercept and Starting Something New. The person that sent this to me, they wanted to highlight that he had taken this internal document of The Intercept's staff org, right? And it, the point is that half of the staff in The Intercept are, you know, kind of management and marketing and finance stuff. And the other half is journalists, but the sides are equal or perhaps even bigger towards the, you know, corporate side. And this org chart is like supposed to be saying, hey, corporate interests are, you know, taking over at the intercept. And in particular, he is complaining that certain stories that he wrote that were critical of like billionaire owners of, I think, the Washington Post or, but whatever the case, you know, like billionaire owners, the story got squashed in his telling because the corporate side were nervous that this would be responded to badly by the millionaire billionaires supporting the intercept. So they are reliant on donations, but also funding from their own billionaire, right? So I don't doubt that is likely to have occurred like we're only getting it from one side but i think there's a lot of legitimacy in it, right so mm-hmm. so all that perfectly fine and highlighting other stories that you know you think were spiked without legitimacy also a reasonable thing but the thing that i found matt was first of all this substack post when i read it a lot of it came across as very familiar to me from the content that we cover here. So let me read just a bit of it. I'm leaving DC to move back to Wisconsin, excited to embrace independence, both in my journalism and from the Washington bubble. The reason so much of the news media sucks is they aren't writing for you. They're writing for their sources in Washington, for the industries they cover, for rich people, and for fancy awards committees. Just take a look at the ads they run for investment banks, defense contractors, oil companies. Unless you're in the market for any of these products, they aren't writing for you. I want to write for you. I want to be an unabashed partisan for the vast majority of Americans who despise the people who run the country, putting my finger in the eye of the elites, frog marching us through their managed decline of the American standard of living. The most effective way I can do this is through journalism that arms you with a better understanding of subjects elites don't like the rabble meddling with, chief among them, the national security state. But I also want to be able to write without fear of billionaires, wealth, or Wall Street. And when I say journalism, I'm not talking about democracy dying in darkness or holding power to account or any of that sanctimonious bullshit. I'm talking about being a foreign in the side of our self-appointed betters. At its most basic level, I want to help you understand what's actually going on in the world, but not how the mainstream media does it with their sanctioned leakers and their endless hand jobs of retired generals and other celebrity architects of our decline, and so on. Mm. Does that sound familiar, that rhetoric? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think is what you're saying that regardless of the degree of truth to the fact, right, that like media companies are influenced by the people that own them and commercial interests, this has been something that's been true ever since they figured out how to use the printing press. The presentation of that, which is setting himself up as, as a principled a truth teller, as, as something of a hero whose his primary motivations are to you know, get out of this stultifying censorship and, and bring the truth to the people, it sounds pretty much the same as what, how our gurus, how they position themselves. Russell Brand, yeah. what's the difference between what Russell Brand says or what Glenn Greenwald says? Or if you want the like, very unflattering comparison, this sounds a lot like Alex Jones's claim right? The elites and the powerful want to keep you behind the screen. And I'm bringing you the truth because I can speak to power, right? Mm-hmm. The, the media is lying to you. And just again, Matt, the, listen to this. My best stories will be your story, how they want your acquiescence for the war party, how they want your money to pay for their follies, how they want to limit the information you receive, how they want to be up your ass controlling every aspect of your life, 
I want to take it to the billionaires, expose the fraud and avarice of the national security state and the corporation, and explore a concept I have of journalism 2.0. I'm not going to bother clearing my reporting with so-called experts at think tanks, bankrolled by head chopper authoritarian regimes like Saudi Arabia, by military contractors or by billionaires. And I'm certainly not going to hide behind weasel words like experts say, journalism's device for pretending like they're objective. Again, like just transpose this from a kind of left wing uh, speak truth to power context to any of the figures that we cover and people would immediately note the very heavy hand of rhetoric there. And like you say, this isn't to say documenting corruption or covering, you know, information being misrepresented or politicians trying to massage how facts are presented, millionaires doing dodgy things, whatever. That's all reasonable and fine. And you can highlight that it's going on. But this dose of like super self-serving populist rhetoric that the world is being controlled by these evil elites that just want to control every aspect of your life. How is it different from what James Lindsay is saying? Or, yeah. uh, you know, any number. It, and the answer is, it isn't. It's just yeah. a left-wing version of it. Yeah. I think there's truth in what you say. I can I can imagine the sympathetic, that is, to, 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 to this guy, Ken Klippenstein, responses here, which would be, no, but Chris... There are unhealthy controls over the media from, you know, powerful mm-hmm. interests. There are important stories that the mainstream media doesn't, you know, want to give enough attention to and so on. But yes, you hear exactly the same <laughs> kind of um, yeah. r- responses from from the, the, the fans of the gurus. There, there could well be, but it's the nebulous nature of, of the claims, right? That they're all, you know, it's all corrupt, you know, they're, they're all, you can't trust any of them. Whereas me, me personally... I'm the one that's going to carry. I want to write for the people. Yeah, and it's. And I'm looking at the comments. It certainly had the desired effect. Um, and like, I, I've this. I'm sensitive to this, I guess, because I've I've got a currently got an honor student who's working through responses on anti-vax YouTube videos to really get a sense of of how people perceive them and and whether or not the, you know the, what I suspect is that the shtick works that they that they present themselves as being these brave you know, heroic figures that are that are against the, you know, draining the swamp and, you know, tackling the evil conspiracies of, of Big Pharma and so on. And yes, people do in their comments talk about what a hero they are, you know, how, how, how much they appreciate the brave stance they're taking. You know, I think your thesis is, is that the intention is something of a self-aggrandizing one. And um, I, I, I think it's effective. Yeah. And so the reason I mentioned this is because like we like the folks over at QAnon Anonymous, for example, right? They're pretty critically minded folks. They do very good coverage of a whole variety of topics we've had Travis view on. But, you know, I like QAnon Anonymous's coverage and they had Ken Klippenstein on to discuss, you know, what was going on at The Intercept and his like new efforts right and i i'm just going to play a couple of clips from that episode about the way things are framed right so here is the him kind of being introed in the episode in many direct and indirect ways flagship outlets like cnn msnbc fox news the new york times the washington post and others serve the interests of the united states ruling class to the detriment of us commoners i've been quoted in four of those outlets that's right i'm trying to ruin your career take him away (laughs) you know there uh we'll do the opposite of the thing they do with cops we'll just say uh there are some good apples (laughs) (laughs) Then there are outlets that for many represent a bastion of independent investigative journalism, like The Intercept. But even they aren't immune to the encroaching influence of corporations and billionaires. This has come into sharper focus recently when Ken Klippenstein, investigative journalist and friend of the show, published a Substack article entitled Why I'm Resigning from The Intercept, in which he laid out the increasing corporatization of the outlet and its adverse effects on the, quote, fearless and adversarial journalism it's supposed to produce. Their episode does mostly focus on, you know, the stories that he presented as being censored or being put through unnecessary hurdles, right, to prevent the story from getting out or whatever. Now, one of the issues there, though, is that you're hearing from a disgruntled journalist who's left 
an outlet, right? And I suspect that most of the things that he's talking about are, are true. But in some cases where he's complaining, for example, about a story being overly litigated, like that the lawyers were just throwing up blocks to try and prevent it from being published. That was his take, right? But you don't hear any response. So there's, again, so many people from outlets, mainstream outlets and alternative outlets that can make the same sort of claims. And in most cases, that's fine. You know, like you you can hear the claim, but you shouldn't automatically assume that the full story is being told by somebody who has, you know, mm. a perceived grievance because of like the stuff that we talked about with grievance mm. mongering and the fact that there are incentives to present yourself as a like fearless mm. person standing up yeah. against the man. And I guess in a case like that, the alternative explanation that the organization has legitimate legal concerns, I mean, that seemed reasonable, right? Because um, outlets do get sued routinely by people that don't like their stories. And if they don't have all their their, their facts cross-checked and validated, then they can have to pay a lot of money. Yeah. So the next clip that I want to play relates to experts, right? And we already heard it in a bit in the extracts that I read from the Substack article. But listen to the way mainstream so-called experts are framed here. Yeah, so I think conventional journalism is kind of trapped in a straitjacket of norms, of conventions, of rules. Um, and to give you guys a few examples, one of them that I listed in the resignation letter, which I uh, hope people read because I explore this at, at length, one of them is hiding behind expertise. And I'm not saying that it's not worthwhile to talk to experts on you know technical matters that you don't understand, like a computer scientist is going to explain um, computer things to me, or a legal expert is going to s- explain the law, which I don't understand. But when it's harmful is when the media hides behind it and editorializes and pretends like this is the objective opinion of of these experts that just exist in the ether that can tell you something. And so very often when major media wants to wants to tilt a story in a certain direction, they don't want their name on it. So they'll hand pick. And I know how this works because, you know, I've been in the business. If editors want somebody that's going to push the story in a certain direction, they basically get you to um, use an expert like a ventriloquist dummy. And you tell them, you essentially queue up what they're going to say. And they give you, they basically say what you said back to them. And then you write it down, expert said. It's kind of like, well, okay, the expert technically said that, but you you basically made them say that, isn't it? Like you saying it? And so I think there's a fundamental lack of honesty about this kind of authorial voice of God that exists in a lot of the uh, mm-hmm. prestige outlets where you, you pretend you don't exist. It's just this omniscient narrator um, that is like perfectly neutral. I'd like mm. to hear some some examples of that. I mean, like it, it's certainly the case in some circumstances, like in like in legal cases, for instance, right? The, 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 the lawyers engage a expert witness who's going to, say what they want them to say. But I, I think there is a, a point to like articles and media outlets. They can select experts that they know are going to give a particular reading on an issue. And, you know, you can make, for example, on the lab leak, if you select Richard E. Bright, Alina Chan and Matt Ridley, you're going to get a very sympathetic account to lab leak has been you know, prohibited to be discussed and it's been censored. So you certainly can cherry pick experts and like promote an editorial line. And a skilled journalist can use leading questions to get, you know, particular kinds of quotes that they want. That is true. But the way it's presented there sounds to me very similar to how, for example, anti-vaxxers would say that the media is constructing a narrative, right? Like it's just citing experts saying, oh, there's a general consensus that exists and whatnot. So there's like media literacy, which is a perfectly reasonable and and fair point. But Klippenstein seems to be going more towards the like Glenn Greenwald side of things where like, Mm -hmm. anyway, who are these experts? And they're also politically biased. And, you know, aren't they just trying to increase their profile by saying what the media wants them to say. And yeah, it just, I felt like if there was an anti-vaxxer on QAnon Anonymous making those points, that they would be more willing to push back about, you know, yes, there's there's absolutely feelings in journalism, there's absolutely biases, but this doesn't mean expert opinion is completely untrustworthy and can only be used for very technical issues. Yeah, well, Ken Clipperson. So he's moving to the to publish independently on the on uh, Substack. Is that right? Yeah. 
He's starting his own media, well, like, like Barry Weiss kind of yeah. thing, basically, yeah, is, and, I think is what he envisions. People like Glenn Greenwald are on there as well, right? Or Mary Hassan recently yeah. started, like yeah. ZTO. Or, so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, I guess I'm just reiterating what you're saying, which is that, yes, there's obviously issues with journalism, just like there's issues with academia, just like there's issues with government or any number of institutions you, you care to name. But to consume this kind of thing critically, like you said, be aware that he's he's a disgruntled uh, employee who left, right? He's got his own issues and problems and his own perceptions there. And his own politics. And his own politics. And he's got his own incentives, I guess, to just like the gurus do, to, to claim that you don't go to any of these uh, conventional sources, come to me and people like me. Yeah, and similarly, Matt, this distinction, which a lot, again, this is something that the gurus often talk about, that like basically everything is opinion. Everything is narrative, right? Everybody just has their own narrative. The mainstream media is pushing narratives. The alternative media has its own, you know, well, actually, the general presentation is that the alternative media is, you know, addressing the narratives that other people have, truthfully. But when it comes to push to shove, they often justify it by, well, we might have a skew, we might have a bias, but like so does everywhere else, right? We're all down in the muck here. Nobody is approaching things from a purely objective view. And again, while it's true that like you should consume all media critically, you should realize that there are editorial forces, that there are, you know, potentially requirements for, you know, like the BBC has to maintain impartiality and people accuse it on both sides of not doing that but it it has mm. like a remit that means it it has to do that or it can yeah. you know be held accountable but as well as the most basic market forces which is to publish material a broadcast material that is going to be popular get attention yeah like yeah. Not, be bore, not be boring so that there is <laughs> incentive across the board um regardless of what your financial backers or your politics are to, to, to publish news that is going to be a little bit on the side of, oh, my God, what fresh new hell is this? Yeah, but this call that we often hear in the gurus here to basically completely wipe out the distinction between opinion style, partisan journalism and journalism that strives to be more factually accurate and like has an editorial process, right? The, listen to this. I think there's a lot more honesty if you just come to your readers and say, look, here are my priors. This is what I think. Decide for yourself, but this is where I'm coming from, rather than this is exactly what expertise has has offered up. Because nobody believes any of that. And that explains a lot of the disdain that people have for press, because they know media are just people like them trying, you know, just trying and, you know, often failing, but trying to, and that they're not on some pedestal and above the, you know, biases that any ordinary person experiences. And so that's what I mean about moving away from it. I'm not, this is not a call for, you know, I think the distinction between opinion and hard journalism is kind of misleading because it's always going to be imbued with the um, assumptions that you have about the world. The question to me is if, if the writer is honest about that or not. So it's a call for honesty about the limited data set we're working with, our limited faculties, and the fact that we're just trying to do our best. Well, there's a way to interpret that positively, positively, which charitably, is charitably, yeah, which is to be aware of of any sources, biases, and preconceptions, and and so on, and and to factor that in, which is what you've been saying. But there's another way to interpret it, which is that objectivity is is a mirage, an um, illusion, yeah, an illusion. People who are pretending to be trying to do uh, dispassionate fact-based reporting or this applies equally well to scientific stuff as well uh fooling themselves and fooling you really there's nothing but emotion led in rhetoric so let's let's lean into that one of the issues i have with the logic there is it isn't that journalists are better people it would be that the process is more robust in terms of like checks and balances right so you could have like a terrible journalist but if they were required to go through processes that made their reporting more accurate, right? That should, in theory, be better than somebody who can just publish whatever they want yeah, on, the blogging, internet blogging on the internet. Blogging on the internet. Yeah. 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 But or they have streaming. No yeah. Yeah. They have, they have no checks or balances. I mean, the kind of future that really I find a bit depressing is that like you have a situation where, where like regardless of your, of where you stand on any kind of ideological spectrum, 
there is this kind of selective trust of institutions, right? So yeah. right wingers will be very happy to 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 point to uh, mainstream media sources or or new scientific evidence when it suits them. But when they don't like the stuff that's coming out of that, they can disregard it as this is the mainstream, lamestream media. This is the, the work. It's repeating the biases now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like, like the left also likes to make recourse to authoritative institutional sources. But when you sort of have this kind of sort of this, this line running through your head as well, it gives you the wiggle room to kind of just be selective about about what you accept and what you don't accept just based on your preferences. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that simply being a journalist at a mainstream institution means that you're going to be a better journalist than somebody working in an alternative media outlet. I'm saying that processes which are designed to try and reduce bias and fact check and whatnot, the more robust they are, they should lead to better journalism in most cases, right? There might be individual exceptions or whatnot, but the presentation that it's all it's all bias and we just all should acknowledge that we're basically all substackers writing opinion pieces. I don't think that's true because like I think actual good journalism requires trying to find out if sources are correct, getting corroborating evidence, reaching out to people for their perspective on things and, and so on and doing things that like most people don't do in their course of consuming information, right? That's why there's a specialist job, <laughs> which yeah. it's yeah. in theory, and, and, in theory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's why larger organizations have a bit of an advantage there, right? Because they're a large target, they can and are sued for inaccuracies, right? They pay a, a very tangible cost for misinformation, whereas you know, independent content creators like you and me, Chris, are actually too are often too small a target. So, so those legal mechanisms that he described as just being, oh, this is this is just used as a as a way of blocking the truth from coming out. I mean, that may be, you know, who knows about his individual case there? Maybe it was, but in general, they are there to ensure that the outlet has the truth defense. Yeah, I mean that is true, but I'm aware also that that can work in the opposite direction, where like smaller content creators can be bullied by like for legal threats in a way that larger institutions can often riff stand right right mm -hmm. and uh, i i feel like if you're a significant alternative media figure you probably are likely to face potential legal threats if you like slander someone you know in the in the same respect so i think it could go in the direction that he's talking about where there is the case where some story the mainstream doesn't want to cover it because of there isn't enough evidence for it yet and it's, you know, potentially provocative. But alternative media will cover it because they think it's important and because they're willing to be, like, more risky and stuff. So, like, there, there's costs and benefits, right? There's a trade-off. But that's the thing. So you, you should read all the media consuming it with a critical mindset that, like like he says... Nobody is completely dispassionate. No outlet has no, absolutely no editorial line. But that does not then equate to kind of essentially what he is suggesting, which does sound a bit like opinion journalism and fact-based journalism. The line is now very, very fuzzy because like I'm still very aware of when there's a Reuters article versus like a Substack post, right? In most cases. Yeah. An illustration of the blurring of boundaries in another way though matt is like bohemian grove that place where billionaires and millionaires go to hang out right bohemian grove is the thing that alex jones one of the things that got him attention originally where he broke into the grove he, you know and was able to film people doing weird uh like rituals in a forest right and the way it was spun by alex and all the people is a satanic you know child sacrifice ceremonies but basically it's a men's club for very rich people financial elites and political elites have went there and hung around uh you know like it kind of like the freemasons or that stuff this is what like rich people like to do all the time is like you said it like don't they have better things to do but when people are elites they very much like you know getting involved in weird things that have like 
secret clubs or elite institutions and whatnot. Like a lot of it is cosplay uh, of things. And it's, it's really, you know, like a social club. But in some cases, it is going to be that there are influential people meeting and talking about okay. stuff. I get it. Right. I get it. So I imagine like, yeah, obviously like Davos, I could see how um, yes. it, it, it would attract conspiracy theories like flies to shit. Right. And Davos exists. The World Economic Forum exists. The Skull and Bones group that George Bush was involved with exists, right? All these elite groups at Oxford and Cambridge also exist right so this is it's not that there's nothing there but it's often like the sensationalized version it's actually much more boring it's just rich people hanging around with all the rich people you know being weird that's what it is and so al this is like a mainstay of alex jones reporting and uh it came up in the klippenstein uh content so Listen to this. So what's up with uh, the Intercept blocking the publication of a list of the Bohemian Grove members? Well, what, what happened there? And uh, yeah, you got any names for us, Ken? Yeah, is Drake on that list? Or He will know the names eventually because that story will come out. But that was actually um, obtained by a colleague of mine, Daniel Bogoslaw, a very good reporter, who got pages this pages and pages long document. It's several years old. So I think it's maybe like five years old or so at this point. But it was just this exhaustive membership role for the um, people on it. And I, I wish I could tell you who's on it. I don't want to step on his toes because it's his story. It's not my story. He let me look at it. And I will say <laughs> the, the names on it, it, these are very powerful people. You know, these are uh, four-star, retired four-star military generals. These are business executives, things like that. But it's like a lot more mundane than you would think. You know what I mean? Like another an interesting uh, facet of this I learned w- while looking at this story was that even, so it's a gentleman's only club. So not just the membership, even the waiters are only men. So it's a very weird like vibe to the entire thing and and he'll come up with the story eventually i'm sure but that's that's the only thing in a way of a kind of teaser that i can give you about it at this point what do you think about that so it's got a, a list of people who who attended this sometime some years ago hmm. yeah <laughs> Look, okay. why is that, like that is a story that would be the lead on infowars and the bit that surprised me is like why are cured on anonymous like you know kind of like this Tell us about this story. Like, so there's a group of rich people at this organization, which we know that exists, and somebody has got access to the membership list. And Ken Clippenson says, actually, it's pretty more mundane. Like, it's, you know, it's actually not that exciting. But I'm like, right. But even, like, even if it was, you know, Donald Trump, what's the news? Like, rich people hanging around together or, or or we don't even know they hang around together just our members of a yeah. like you know this uh secretive elitist club yeah i guess it's news if you believe that some dastardly plots are being hatched there or something in that case it would be news if a four-star general went there i already know that generals and tech billionaires and politicians talk and you know like each other or have like it just, it, it, so it's just, Matt, to me, it's more that it was so in- incongruous to hear this on QAnon Anonymous, you know, like um, kind of, mm. it just, yeah, it just struck me. And then the last, the last clip from this, whenever they're finishing the interview, they do seem to note that there's a little bit of a parallel in the presentation that has been offered, right? Like how does what Klippenstein is suggesting differ from any number of the people that they would cover, right? Or, or people on Substack that they criticize regularly and see what you think of his answer. I have one last question, and I don't know if it's a good question or not, but, you know, worth mentioning, I think, given some of the, uh, you know, our, our prior discussion, you know, when you talk about News 2.0, you know, I know you're going to do it right. I know you're not going to be like one of these, you know, guy, guys online with 100 threads, uh, y- you know, because you have no oversight. You're just sort of baking. Why is that? Why, you know, what separates? Because you see a lot of those guys say, this is the new media. This is new news. This is this is what you're not going to get. Because you, you see now liberals are even saying, you know, 
screw CNN, screw MSNBC. You know, the, they're they're turning against corporate media in a, in a way as well. And I guess, you know, my question is, what is it do you think that separates the work that you're going to be doing from somebody like that? Is it a, is it a lack of bias or is it a, a feeling to not be so, you know, red v. blue, red team, blue team? Like, what is it that separates that kind of reporting from somebody that would describe themselves as, as new media that is essentially just doing opinion baking conspiracy theories? It's about who I'll be reporting for, which I hope is for ordinary people. I think that the essential problem with media is not necessarily uh, partisanship or any of the other things that you mentioned. It's that they're writing for other media. They're writing for their sources in Washington in order to maintain access. They're writing for industry. You know, open up a magazine, uh, go to a website. Look, I always tell people, if you want to know who they're writing for, take a look at the ads. Can you afford what they're advertising? If you can't, they're probably not writing for you. Mm. I remember as a kid seeing ads, not just for products that my family couldn't afford, but for products that no individual would buy, like uh, financial instruments. I remember there was an ad for like uh, Charles Schwab or something. I remember as a kid, I asked my dad, I said, why are they advertising Charles Schwab? What, nobody, you don't go to the store and buy Charles Schwab. And he's like, <laughs> oh, well, that's for businesses to buy. And, it, and then it dawned on me, it's like, oh, that's the audience for, th- for this stuff, for businesses. So I want to write for just regular people, which sounds, you know, easy easy and simple and it should be and I think it is but a lot of the press doesn't do that and it's not necessarily this nefarious thing of that they're only trying to you know hook up rich people it's that that's the world that they inhabit they live in a bubble they're not aware that there are people outside of that world yeah so I, I think he played that to to highlight the kind of um the populist <laughs> angle to it um but actually Chris I'll just bring up a little technical point of order a lot of companies advertise uh, in fact probably most of them advertise not so much to hey here's here's a new gizmo for your kitchen for you to buy but but rather they advertise for for brand awareness and essentially public relations so in australia for instance you'll see you'll see any number of ads for like like mining companies right you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) showing what wonderful things that the the iron ore you know uh, mining companies now nobody's in the market for Either iron mines. or, or their <laughs> mines or any of that stuff, but they are actually advertising to scare quotes normal people, right? Because they're, they're looking to build build a positive image of of themselves, their company, or their brand. So, I think his logic there is a little bit broken as well. But what what did you have to say about it? I feel that the QAnon host was setting him up, like he tried hard to say, look. There's a lot of this that sounds very similar to stuff that we criticize regularly. And I know you're a good guy. You know, like, I'm not criticizing them for having, a, you know, an interpersonal relationship. But, like, they obviously want him to answer that by talking about, you know, the process that he's going to do differently or something like that. And yeah. the, his answer is, I'll speak for the people. The real yeah. people, unlike yeah. those Washington fat cats and their lackeys. And, you know, and it, like, yes, there is a bubble with media, likes to talk about media and all that. Again, there's like legitimate points there. But whenever somebody's answer about how they're different is they speak for the people that have been, you know, yeah. ignored by the leads. Like, come on, it's not it's not a very hidden message. It's just so like, fine, if you want to believe that, That's all right. But then you have to understand that that is the message that populists use everywhere. And you can't really dismiss people for finding it appealing because that's the same message that somebody that you like just told you. And because you agree with their politics, you're like, yeah, but they they actually mean it, whereas the other people yeah. Yeah. don't. They actually, and- they actually really speak for the people, whereas Alex Jones and Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, they don't. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it's great that they're in this independent sort of um, platform and they're not going to be restrained by you know the the lawyers and the editorial oversight and the bloody fact checkers yeah like tim pool yeah tim pool (laughs) yeah that's right speak truth to power um drain the swamp yeah people power so look it's fine i mean probably some of them are um totally you know working disinterestedly to help the people but keep in mind their their income does come from subscriptions and clicks and donations and things like that. There are incentives that push you in other directions if you make yourself an avatar of the online people, right? Yeah. Or or the real, even the, the real people in the real world, right? Like the the people that aren't online, whichever way you choose to, to go, uh, yeah. there are incentives that will push you in, in certain yeah. ways. And they're well trodden because we see them constantly invoked in the guru sphere. I thought this was a good thing to 
play because I am more sympathetic to the politics of the kind of criticism of corporate greed and of, you know, like Washington insiders and four-star generals getting kickbacks and all that. Like those are all the kind of topics that are, you know, appealing to left-wing people, I think. But Chris, can you just remind me, because this the story does feel familiar about a journalist working at a publication and being very disgruntled, very unhappy with how things are done there, and then leaving and there being a big differences of, of, of opinion culturally in terms of their values and stuff, and then striking out on independent media. Could you remind me of any names of, of other ju- people who have trod this route? Are you referring to Barry Weiss? I am referring to Barry Weiss. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if there <laughs> and were more. And That's right. And it's like the story is almost exactly the same, right? It's just yeah. it's put, politically it's inverted, but yes. all structurally in all respects, it's exactly the same story. So yeah, maybe just regardless of where your political sympathies lie, maybe just apply the same rubric. The issue in part for me was that like one of our listeners was sharing this to me and they weren't picking up on any of the like stuff which really seemed overtly the red flag stuff that we highlight. You know, they were one they were highlighting to me this issue about like the corporate stuff taking over media. And I was like, but but you did notice <laughs> that, that that like slightly concerning populist rhetoric as well, right? Like, Mm. because like the same point, the last point I just wanted to make is that it isn't to say that the stories that Ken Klippenstein is talking about, or even the parts where it's, uh, he said, she said, and we don't have the, the other side of the story. He could be completely right. His story was censored. It was spiked because of the sensitivities of a millionaire or because the intercept didn't want the ruffle fellers of potential donors. All of that, I fully believe, is possible and that you are right to legitimately critique it. But it's the other stuff that comes along with this. So it isn't to say, like, discount all that. Never trust critiques of mainstream institutions. The alternative media is always going to be worse because of fact-checking. No, there are there are strengths and weaknesses to both. There are biases in lots of different directions. But just like the warning flags in the content, like the, the kind of secular guru stuff that we talk about, the those are there in this post that Ken Klippenstein did and in the rhetoric that he used in the QAnon Anonymous. And it felt a little bit like the blind spot is because of the political sympathies. And uh, that you should just be yeah. wary of that. You know, us too. Yeah, Absolutely us right. too. Yeah, I mean, I'm just it makes me think of the other stories of individuals leaving an institutional organizational <laughs> context, right? And and pointing to things. It could be Brett and Weinstein and Heather Haying, right? Pointing to yeah. the, you know, extreme wokeness that makes it impossible for, for them to do their good scientific work there and they're gonna strike out alone and do science elsewhere. To to say that there are issues with their narrative and how they're positioning themselves is not to say that Evergreen College wasn't very woke and maybe it was a bit stultifying. That that could well be true. So it, it's it's not that there aren't, there isn't some or a lot of measure of truth in the things that they're pointing at. It's just that we've just seen so many exiles from uh, institutions, whether they're media institutions or academic institutions who promote themselves as being, I am going to speak the real truth to the people unfettered by these awful constraints. Often they're woke constraints or the censorious nature of science or whatever it is, and this right-leaning thing. If you see the exact same thing, but it's speaking to a left-leaning audience, then just be aware. This is also not us seeking to create like a a beef, right? Like QAnon Anonymous, Overall, I really like their content and their approach to things. I think they are very critical. So this was notable in part because it felt like they weren't being, you know, the the way that they usually are. So, you know, uh, you should be able to criticize people that you overall like uh, the same way, you know, you criticize people that you don't, maybe. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, you, and you can criticize us too. We won't be upset. 